This is Dr. Coronado coming to you to talk about options for fibroid treatment. So many women have fibroids. 50% of women have fibroids. Um, sometimes they don't cause any trouble, but sometimes they can get very large, create heavy periods, or even create a sensation of pressure or pain in the pelvis because they're so large. So we're going to talk about a surgical option um, or two that might interest you and what the pre-operation planning looks like. So you might have been told by your OB-GYN that you have fibroids and they possibly did an ultrasound. So this is an image of an ultrasound measuring the fibroid of a patient that we're going to follow all the way through her course including her surgery. As you can see on the ultrasound, the fibroid images are this, this black circle that's measured. So she has an eight centimeter fibroid that's very large. But underneath that fibroid, there's a, a shadow created on the ultrasound. So if there are any other fibroids hanging out down here, those are gonna be a little bit hard to find on the ultrasound, which is why ultrasound only picks up some of the fibroids we have, but not all. So I'm gonna show you another image on this patient. Another fibroid that she had, this one was seven centimeters and a little bit behind the bladder. So right here, this is her bladder full of urine. Um, and this is the fibroid that we're measuring. See how it looks like a ball. Fibroids are muscle tumors in the uterus that usually form a round ball. Um, some people decide to go ahead and get a hysterectomy. They decide to take the whole uterus out. It's a less risky surgery, but some people still want the option to carry children or just don't feel comfortable parting with their womb. So this person decided that she wanted to proceed with a myomectomy. That means removal of the fibroid. So the next step in our conversation in a preoperative plan is to do an MRI. So I'm gonna show you her MRI images and you can see that on the MRI, we can see so much more of the anatomy. So let me kind of point some things out here to you. Um, first of all, this is the spine coming down in the MRI, and these are the fibroids. Notice how you can see all of the fibroids on one screen at one time. This is what's called a sagittal image. It's as though the MRI machine is cutting this way through the uterus. So we have fibroid, fibroid, fibroid right here sitting on the bladder, right on that bladder. Whew, that does not feel good. And then this right here, that's normal uterus. That's how big the normal uterus should be. But we have all these fibroids growing around. Now, what ultrasound can miss sometimes are the smaller fibroids. So here's an image where we see some of the smaller fibroids that are a little bit out to the side. So the radiologist that I work with reads these images to me and says, this is where they are, like a map. You want to look high, low, front, back, right, left, and that helps me as I approach the surgery. She also tells me about the classification of the fibroids. So some fibroids are completely hidden in the wall of the uterus. That's called intramural. Those are a little bit harder to find robotically, which is why the MRI is so important for mapping and telling the location and telling us how many there are. Only one in 10,000 fibroids is cancerous, but MRI can usually pick that up as well. So when we take somebody to the operating room, we wanna know that we're not doing any harm. We wanna know that those fibroids don't have traits or appearances of cancer. So back to the classification, some fibroids are hidden in the wall. Some fibroids are almost on a tree trunk. See this here? That's called pedunculated. You're going to see that in the video. Pedunculated fibroids can be some of the easiest to remove. Subserosal fibroids are pretty easy to find. I'll show some of those in the video as well. They are poking into the pelvic space. Submucosal fibroids can cause a lot of damage, even if they're teeny tiny. Um, these fibroids are in, they're infringing into the personal space of the uterine lining, and these even small ones can create tons of heavy bleeding. Sometimes we can remove the submucosal fibroids by going in with a camera and cleaning them out from the inside. 
That's called a hysteroscopic myomectomy. It's done with a camera, a scope, inside the uterus. That's very easy to recover from, but it's only suitable for this kind of fibroid. Now I'd like to show you the video and talk through some of the things we've seen about this special patient on her ultrasound, her MRI, and the different types of fibroids that she has. Hi, here we are in the video. I'm going to show you, we already injected, you saw our safety step of injecting the solution that helps tighten up the blood vessels so we reduce our blood loss. This is a pedunculated fibroid on a stalk. Do you see this stalk that I'm burning? There is a huge fibroid that won't even fit on the whole screen above us. Huge. Get that out of the way. We have another pedunculated fibroid. These are the easiest to remove, quite frankly, because we don't have to make as large of an incision in the muscle of the uterus, so we have a lot less bleeding. Now, you've probably seen my robotic myomectomy video where we talk about safety steps. Sewing these fibroids together like pearls on a string and injecting with that solution that helps the minimize the bleeding are important safety steps. We're going to sew this back up now. Oh, no child left behind. That's a tiny fibroid that we want to make sure we get out. Dr. Pimple Popper has nothing on us when we are taking out fibroids. So we sew up those two defects and now we're moving on to the larger fibroid. This is very deep. This is what we call intramural and even submucosal. This impinged into her uterine cavity. It takes a while and we have to be patient with this dissection to make sure we free the fibroid in the safest way. Now you see here where the risk of bleeding comes from when we talk about myomectomies. Hysterectomies actually have a lot less bleeding because we aren't cutting into the muscle of the uterus. Whereas you can see here, having to make this incision, even though we use cautery in the muscle of the uterus results in quite a bit more blood loss. Fortunately, I am almost always able to avoid getting into the cavity of the uterus, which can cause scar tissue that could impact a future pregnancy. Now, a defect that deep is going to have to be repaired in multiple layers. I sewed this up in two to three layers to make sure that we closed all the spaces and I didn't have any bleeding. In fact, this patient had no bleeding overnight. Her hemoglobin was very stable. She did great. She was up and walking around that evening. Nice stitch there, ready to go. Now, this patient was scheduled for a procedure called ACCESSA, A-C-E-S-S-A. ACCESSA is a less invasive surgical option to shrink fibroids where a small needle goes directly into the fibroid and gives it a radio frequency ablation. That was my plan for this fibroid and its friend that you're going to see underneath. And the reason for that was the size. The size was pretty small. But also, you're going to see that these fibroids are wrapped around blood vessels. We are going to lose the majority of our surgical blood from this site. Well, you might ask, why didn't you do it? Why didn't you do the excessa? Well, the insurance company refused to cover it. Uh, her insurance company said that that was not a necessary part of the procedure, so she and I talked through it and decided that removing the fibroids in the safest way possible, as long as I felt that I could, was the best option. So here we've removed those two fibroids, and we have this large defect very close to the major blood vessels. As a safety maneuver, I'm spraying that area with an agent called a hemostatic agent that helps it not ooze or bleed any further. It's almost like a glue. Now I'm going to suture that area together and I had to cut one of her supportive ligaments to the uterus to give, my, give myself access to the space where the fibroids were. So I'm bringing that ligament back together. That's called the round ligament. And I feel really pleased with this repair and with the fact that there's no bleeding. However, it was my first choice to do excessa on that area. I'm now spraying the glue or the hemostatic agent all over all of our sites to help prevent risk of bleeding. And then I'm turning to the part of the procedure where we remove these fibroids. I am able to remove fibroids even as large as these through an incision in the belly button that is invisible after six weeks post-operation. The way I do that is by putting the fibroids into this bag. To prevent spread of dangerous fibroid tissue, 
that can create more fibroids, it is imperative that fibroids be removed in a contained fashion in the bag. This is what it looks like when we're done. I pull that bag up through the belly button and cut that fibroid into tiny pieces, which takes a little bit of time, but now all those tiny pieces have come out and given her her most cosmetic result and also her best recovery with smallest incisions. So as you approach your treatment plan for fibroids, make sure that your surgeon is talking to you about the location of your fibroids, clearing you preoperatively with an MRI for your safety, and make sure your surgeon has good experience in all the surgical options, including robotic myomectomy and excessa radiofrequency ablation. Thanks so much, and you can always reach out if you need more information from me.